Inspiration for Teachers podcast, bringing you dynamic and inspirational educator interviews. Our fascinating guests share their professional challenges and creative resolutions for success. Discover their workable strategies, ideas, and resources to reach your educational goals. And now your host, Kelly Long. Welcome to another show of Inspiration for Teachers. I'm super thrilled to have Jason Borton in the guest seat today. Jason is a passionate educator who places the student at the centre of every decision that he makes. He is the principal of Richardson Primary School Australia and is keen to share his insights into high impact teaching, action research and new approaches to student centred learning. What I like to do at the start of every show, Jason, is to play a little game of random question generator. So if you're ready, here we go. Okay, this question you have no prior knowledge of, but I like to keep people on their toes. So the question is, Jason, how do you overcome resistance to change? And what I mean by that is, as a leader, how do you ensure that everyone within your school environment is willing to embrace new ideas and approaches to learning? Well, I would say that's what, you know, that's one of the challenges of leadership. It's something which we, uh, you know, we do on a an ongoing basis. I think that change is is something which people uh, struggle with, but I guess it's having a clear vision, but also engaging everybody in the conversation about the, the big question about why, not change for change's sake. You really need to be, um, I guess, outlying the benefits, uh, coming back to improve student learning and uh, the research base and the evidence, and uh, and actually do it a bit do it a bit slowly. You know, you can't rush into ex- you know extreme change because I think that that causes you know s- a lot of anxiety within staff. So I think it's bringing them along with you, and it's not just saying we're doing this and and uh, that's it. You know, you have to actually provide some um, some background information about research, and actually it's really powerful if that change can actually come from your teaching staff. They can see the benefits and see the um, the reason behind why we're going to go in a certain direction. So uh, I've seen many leaders fail by just going in with a change agenda and not engaging the staff in the conversation. So I think that's one of the critical aspects of that. And is that through meetings that you do and and setting out a pathway as to how you're going to achieve that? Yeah, I think um, that's part of it. We we actually have lots of um, conversations about uh, why we might look in a new direction, but it's also actually getting some agreement as to uh, whether people can actually commit to it or not, you know, getting a commitment to the change. So we use a scale which, you know, at one end says, you know, I've come fully committed uh, and next might be, well, you know, I agree with it, but I need some more convincing. Uh, in the middle might be, well, I'm not 100% on, on board, but I can agree with it and go with it. And the other end might be, can't do it. You know, I just absolutely can't go that way. And uh, we ask staff to make that commitment based on the conversations we have around the reasons behind why we might make a pedagogical change or a whole school approach change. So uh, getting that commitment, then being able to move forward. If there are people sitting, still sitting in at the end where well, I absolutely just can't do it, well, then we need to work on what, you know, the why and actually uh, see what adjustments we can make to actually get them to a point where they can make a commitment. That's really insightful. Thank you. Let's move on to this next question. And it's a really exciting question. And I find it really inspiring because it allows me to see my guests different perspective on it. And that question is, what excites you right now about the teaching profession? Well, I think that we're highly connected as a as a profession now, you know, um, uh, spaces like Twitter are something, are something where I connect with educators right across the world. It's no longer just within your own backyard. Um, that excites me because I, I, I learn something nearly every day from my colleagues. You know, I'm able to share those experiences, learn about different approaches that might really uh, impact the learning of the um, the teachers in my particular school, but also across the system. I mean, we're, I work in an amazing, connect, amazingly connected system, and I think that one of the things that excites me the most is that school leaders are now really leaders of learning. Where there was once a time where I think there was a lot of principals, for example, that were actually simply managers, you know, and that, that's that's a big part of the job, but it's nowhere near enough these days. We really have to be the trailblazers and leaders of uh, high-impact instructional strategies, and that really excites me because that's the work that I enjoy doing. I enjoy spending cl- time in classrooms every day, and uh, the excitement that I get from working with enthusiastic educators is what, uh, you know, it makes my job a complete pleasure. And what aspects of teaching would you most like to change, large or small? And if it's not been possible, why do you think that is? Uh, I think one of the frustrations we have, uh, certainly in Australia, 
is a move towards a, you know, a very heavily summative assessment top-down approach with regards to test the test regime. We have a national test called NAPLAN, which um, has really hijacked the agenda with regards to uh, uh, you know, narrowing the curriculum down to very specific literacy and numeracy skills. And in many ways, from uh, my perspective, I think that that's to the detriment of really rich, uh, uh, well-designed teaching and learning from our teachers. So uh, that's something which I'm really working with my colleagues to try and uh, affect so that we're not um, drawn into a, a highly competitive situation where it's all about the test. You know, we're, we're nowhere near as, as heavily scrutinised in that way as some other countries, I realise that, but we're really resisting that as, a, you know, a negative change. We want to keep our um, approach in our system is really about personalising learning for students, and the learning is far bigger than uh, only literacy and numeracy, although no, those skills are absolutely critical, but there's, uh, it's just not quite enough these days, you know. Um, Kids need the 21st century competencies about collaboration and being able to work with other people, design, take risks, creativity. Those things aren't things that get can necessarily be tested in a, in a multiple choice test. So I guess that's one of our major challenges. How are you doing that in your school? Well, one of the main things is that I, I've become a, a filter, I guess, from the, from the political messages and the hierarchical messages that come from above and give my teachers permission to focus on the things that make a difference. So I constantly have the conversation with them about it's not about uh, ensuring that you've completed all the content in the curriculum. It's about high quality, high impact pedagogical approaches, knowing your students really well, formative assessment, improving their learning on a day to day basis. So it's an ongoing conversation. I actually I, I think my approach is to empower them to have that mindset rather than be overly concerned about our testing scores. And I think that moves us on nicely to the professional challenge that you're going to share with us today. So can you delve a little bit deeper into that for us, Jason? You know, our school is, a, is what is considered a low socioeconomic status school. We will probably, our, our test results compared to the rest of our, um, our jurisdiction will probably never be at the top, you know, but that's not our driver. Our driver is student learning, growth, improvement, giving them life chances outside of, of the school zone. I mean, if we focus only on the things that are in the test, well, that would be to the detriment of their, their learning. So our, our teachers are, are, are very um, comfortable with that. And I think it actually creates an environment where the kids' learning becomes the forefront, not their results in a test. And so I'm very active within our professional associations with regards to our principals association across Australia and our education unions. I very work closely with their leaders as well uh, to try and um, just influence the conversation. I, I meet with the, um, I get opportunity to meet with our education minister and our uh, what we call our director general, who's our head of education in in our jurisdiction, quite regularly. So probably f uh, six to eight times a year. Uh, let them know what the impact of decisions are on the ground within schools. And uh, if they're negative, then, you know, our parent community are the ones with the voice. And I encourage them through our school board to actually actively engage with the minister and let them know what they think about um, policies which may be not in the best interest of the kids or the school or, the, you know, uh, all our teachers. So how do you ensure that those ministers are listening to you? I mean, you said about the parents and their voice, but is there anything that you do specifically with your teaching staff? Well, I think from our perspective, uh, we invite the minister to come and see what we're doing in our school. And, you know, it's it's visible. You know, he, the, she can actually come to our school and see the learning that's taking place, which has got nothing to do with the standardised test. So uh, our test results, in fact, have actually been quite excellent. You know, our growth in particular has been outstanding, but we don't focus on that. I take her and her advisors through our school and, and just let them see the sort of approaches that our teachers are taking and the impact that's having on student learning. And I think that's the most powerful thing that we can do. And uh, I actually truly believe that that is influencing her, her thinking, that not every school is exactly the same and not one measure is going to be the best way to, to uh, say whether a school is succeeding or not. And you said that your solution to that challenge was by providing a professional learning community. Can you explain in a bit more detail how you go about doing that? A professional learning community really is uh, the development of a culture within our school that we are all learners. And uh, as the principal, I'm the lead learner. So I'm leading by example. I'm actually part of that learning. We're doing the research. The students are bringing to school what skills they do and don't have and then and actually applying approaches which 
will make a difference for them. So the professional learning community involves targeted professional learning for our teachers and also empowering them to be part of teams which we call action learning teams. And those action learning teams actually do the research, engage with the with the implementation of that those strategies and report back to their colleagues and then make recommendations to the staff around specific things that we should do and need to do in order to make a big difference for our students. Teachers are very are front and centre in that approach and they're very empowered. But I also make sure that I'm very visible within that process and I'm supporting them, providing the resources through um, professional learning. Uh, for example, I took my whole teaching staff to Brisbane, which is a, which is about a you know two hour flight for a two day institute with Dylan William, who you might know. So I invested in that, and it cost significant money, but it actually reaped fantastic rewards because we're hearing about the approach that the whole school is taking, and our professional learning community is building their knowledge so that they can have the conversation with anybody who asks about why we are actually doing this. It's not just for the sake of it, it's because we're having an impact on student learning and these are the reasons why. And can I just delve a little deeper into that because um, a lot of schools try to implement action research in the classroom but sometimes they lack the resources and the pressures of what time a teacher has to dedicate to it can be quite limited sometimes. So how do you ensure that that works effectively in the school? Well, I think what we've done is invest in the human resource in that we actually provide time within their teaching day many times throughout the term to actually collaborate with their with their action learning team. So there's time within their teaching day, time outside of the teaching day. We also have reduced our outside of school meetings, especially operational meetings. We do that in other ways. We send memos, we communicate electronically. We don't need everybody in the same room to hear the same messages all the time. So reduce that administrative impact on teachers' time and invest it in, instead into the action learning process. So we've given it nearly full reign and the resources are invested in that strategy quite significantly. So that does cost money, but it's well invested when we see what the outcomes are. And have you come up with any creative ways of reducing the admin? I mean, you mentioned about um, not everyone being in the same room at the same time, but have you come up with any other strategies? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, one of the main things we did was re reduce our written reporting process. You know, down to something we negotiated with our with our parents and asked them what do they really want to know in a snapshot of learning and their written report, and you know they really want to know how their kids are going in those basic skills of literacy, numeracy, or maths and English. They really want to know about their work habits, and then they just want an update as to how they're going in general. So we've reduced that significantly. So what was before a four or five page report, which took many hours for every teacher to do is now something which can be done in a short period of time. So that's just one thing we've done. And instead of doing written reports as our main thing, we actually have the ongoing conversation with parents and bring them in for, for learning journeys and walkthroughs of our, of our classroom so that they can see the learning in action, which you can do. Uh, you can tell the parent so much more in a, in a five-minute conversation than you can in a written report. And, they, and you can show them the work samples, you can show them the, the design, you can show them the learning. So that's one one in particular. But me, our meeting structure is also another one. You know, I'm just saying we've reduced our meetings. We only have two administration meetings each term. And uh, that was a big change for people, but they've really begun to thank me for that because they're actually investing their time in designing learning, assessing, collaborating with their colleagues rather than sitting and listening to, to me or someone else tell them how to suck eggs. <laughs> <laughs> that is really powerful because as a teacher myself, I find that I am spending so much time doing admin and what I really want to be doing is planning lessons and doing resources and making sure that my pupils are learning. So that's a really refreshing approach. Can I just ask you, with the, your parents, are you using any form of social media to connect with them? You know, you were saying earlier about Twitter coming online and how you engage with other professionals, but do you use it in any way to engage with parents? Yeah, that's really interesting. So uh, Twitter for me is is really um, uh, my professional space. It's not why we, we don't connect with our community through Twitter. We actually did some research of our community and asked them about what sort of connectivity they had at home, what sort of phones families had. Yeah, so the research around that was really critical as to what uh, might be the best way for us to communicate with them. And what we found was that many parents didn't in our community didn't have uh, desktop or laptop computers at home, but over 80% of them had smartphones. And 
of that 80%, around 70% of them were on Facebook. So we use Facebook quite extensively. And what it is for us, it's really a bulletin board, a billboard of all of our achievements and events that happen with our school. It's about positive promotion, building the brand of our school, outward facing, I guess, communication. And our parents actually really strongly engage with it. There was a little bit of apprehension about whether there'd be negative comments put up with kids put inappropriate things, etc. But we've actually had none of that. It's actually been a really um, respectful space, and uh, many of my colleagues have actually taken that on in their schools as well and come and seen what we're doing because it really. And if you want to find out about the school, I encourage parents, uh, anyone uh, making inquiries about the school, to check out our Facebook page because it's the best space we've got. I mean, we I think websites. Uh, often a little bit of old technology. That sounds weird, doesn't it? But, um, I mean, people want instant uh, social media to their phone uh, so they can access information quickly. We also have a school app. And on the school app, it's a downloadable app to, uh, you know, all platforms. Parents can write uh, absent notes. They can see what events are on the calendar. We can uh, send out messages via notifications, such as reminders about... Um, you know, need notes to be brought in, etc. If we've got a uh, sports carnival, we can send the location and the map that goes with that via the app. We can advertise parent businesses on there at, at a very low cost. Uh, so that, there are a couple of things that we do with, with regards to really communicating with parents. I mean, the days of just doing written, uh, printed out weekly newsletters are slowly coming to an end. And can I just take you back a couple of steps? You were saying that you um, didn't have any negativity surrounding your Facebook page. Do you think that was down to how you rolled it out to parents? And if so, how did you do that? One of the critical things was who, can, who has control over the content. So, in fact, myself and my deputy principal are the only ones who can add content to that page. So anything that was coming needed to come to us first, and then we could verify it. So everything that went up, we made sure 100% was spelt correctly, was appropriate, uh, was, uh, you know, the photos, every child that went up had um, clearance for media permission, those sorts of things. But we had the conversation with parents and engaged them with it. We sent them uh, emails and in our actual written newsletter about how to connect with it. And uh, we've, we've a small community. of We've only got about 220 students. We've got about 400 families liking our page because what's happened is they've promoted it with their grandfather's, grandmother's extended family so that they can keep an eye on what's happening with their kids, their grandkids and cousins, etc., at their school. So really has, has expanded. But being really clear about the rules, I guess, as well, and, you know, the, the social media policy, we, we ensured that that was up front and centre on the page and that we communicated that with parents and that anything that did happen, so somebody put something up which sounded a bit, you know, inappropriate, I immediately get a notification and took it down. So it was deal with anything immediately and block that person. So... We did have a couple of minor things, but we dealt with it in that way, probably a little bit over the top, but it just stopped any of that nonsense. I think that's a really smart way of moving forward. What we're going to do now, Jason, is we're going to move into the inspiration round, our kind of quick fire round so that you can share with us a few pieces of advice and some little nuggets of resources. Can you share with us your proudest moment? Oh, I guess my proudest moment is actually uh, appointed as the principal of this school. You know, it's something which I, I really strive towards. And the, and the moment that I actually received that, I knew that um, I was going to be able to work with an awesome staff and make a big difference. So I was very proud of that achievement. I'm quite quite a young leader. Many people said that I wouldn't you know, I had to wait my time and it would be another 10 years, etc. But I was so determined and inspired by it. I was really proud. That's really fantastic. With you being a, a young leader, how do you think you, you got to the position that you got to so quickly then? For many reasons, but mainly because I watched, listened and learned from my uh, colleagues. You know, I, I worked in a number of schools and I, I, I listened and, and heard the sorts of ways they negotiated, they led, they managed, they um, spoke with parents and took the, good, took the good from those ones which did it really well and also learned about what not to do. You know, I saw some major failures and, I, you know, I guess that's that's the main reason. I took a lot in. And let's move on to the best advice you've ever received. I think you've delved a little deeper into that already, but let's go there. Yeah, I think one of the things about the, the best advice is that, you know, you can't do it all on your own. You really need to have uh, a great team around you 
and uh, you know, engaging a, a mentor for me was one of the um, one of the the best things that I did. And the advice that uh, he was able to impart to me in a very short period of time led me in in good stead. You know, he'd say things like, you know, um, what the most important thing is to be visible. You know, you need people need to see you uh, engaging with parents, engaging with students, taking an interest. Don't find yourself sitting in your office doing paperwork all day. And so I've taken that, you know, quite strongly. And I, I spend as much poss- time as possible in the classroom. And I think that um, it, it also uh, keeps me uh, motivated, you know. And did you seek out that mentor yourself or did you follow a professional route for that? Well, um, I actually just asked my supervisor, who's our network leader, who's in his role, uh, her role at that point was in charge of 20 schools. And I just sought some advice about somebody who uh, might be a good connection for me and uh, and when I made the contact it was really clear that he was you know he worked in similar schools he had an excellent sense of humor and um, I just really enjoyed spending time with him so that worked for me both personally and professionally you know don't take yourself too seriously and um, you know um, don't think you can solve all the problems you know give, give us a call if you need some help with something and I do that openly. Yeah you definitely need a sense of humor sometimes don't you? Sure. Okay, let's move on to what are your sources of inspiration? Well, I think I, I'm inspired by the people that I work with. You know, I've got some amazing educators here, uh, and I'm inspired by their enthusiasm, and I'm inspired by their willingness to learn, but mostly it's about their um, capacity to actually put all of their energy just about into ensuring that students get exactly what they need. I'm also inspired by, you know, um, very great great minds you know and, and Dylan Williams one of those who really inspires me because I think he he uh, understands what what we need to do to actually you know have an impact on student learning and then let's just move on to something very personal for you so what professional or personal teaching habit or leadership habit do you have that works for you time and again that you can share with our listeners well um, I think for me I spend two full days a week in the classroom out of my five days so as a leader I commit to that. It goes in my diary. It doesn't get changed no matter what. I've missed major meetings with the with the hierarchy because I've committed to this. So uh, I, that means I have to manage my time very well. And I've got a very uh, I've got an excellent um, administrative assistant who uh, who manages my diary. And I and I actually basically handed my diary over to her, and she manages that so that I can actually spend two full days a week in classroom supporting learning, being visible, working with students. When the game's on, you know, well, when the kids are here, we call that, you know, that's game time. You know, that's when you can make a difference. And other things like emails, etc. try to avoid those distractions. And those things just have to happen out of hours because they can um, distract you from the main game. I think it's quite easy to forget what it's like at the chalk face of teaching when you enter into those leadership roles. So it's really good that you're doing that. Well done. Definitely, you know, and I, and I, I try and maintain that, that I actually don't want to ever forget what how hard it is i mean teaching is a hard job and i think as leaders sometimes we can forget that and uh, you know make decisions and just have expectations of people which are a little bit unreasonable a little bit unfair so if we're spending that time in the classroom i think it all helps to build credibility with teachers i do uh, you know i do a lot of teaching and uh, i really enjoy that but it also um I, I, you know, I'm not just saying do as I say, you know, it's um, leading the way and walking the, walking away with them and next to them and making sure we're all doing it together. And avoid the paperwork. Uh, the paperwork, yeah, that's the bane of my existence. But, you know, it's one of those necessary evils that we need to do. But I also am very good at delegating those things and I've got no qualms about doing that. But, you know, there are other people with more time and uh, more skill than me in managing a lot of those things. So why would I need to own those? You know, I'm, very, I'm probably the opposite of a micromanager. Actually, I'm happy for, to, for my um, teachers and my school leaders to lead and be empowered to do that without me looking over their shoulder. Of course, we connect and we, we're on the same page, but I don't need to do it for them. They can own it. I think that's where some leaders go wrong. They try and have such a tight grasp of everything that there's there's no movement and there's no growth there. And I think that's when things get stifled. Definitely. I mean, I, I don't want to own those things either. You know, like I, I want to put my energy into things uh, like leading learning and being in classrooms, which make a difference for kids, not 
you know, administrative tasks. Can you share with our listeners a resource, internet or otherwise, that you think would add value to them in their daily practice? Well, what I really want to do is uh, is just advocate for the work of a um, uh, one of our, our critical friend, whose name is Jim Knight, and he has a, a text which we use and uh, work with greatly. It's really around leading learning, but it's called High Impact Instruction, a Framework for Great T- Teaching. Now, Jim Knight is a is from the US and uh, he came to Australia and we attended a, um, a coaching course that he ran about instructional coaching and we're inspired by his work because it encapsulates what we're attempting to do which is to align our professional learning approach with support for teachers via coaching and mentoring and implementing high impact instructional strategies to make a big difference for our, our teachers. So his book, High Impact Instruction, and uh, what I really like about it, and this is a bit um, high tech, but you know, there's little Q, QR codes that sit within each chapter which take you to links uh, which are videos and more research about the things that he's talking about. So for me, it's a really inspiring resource. And do you feel like you've got the coaching and mentoring aspect of your school correct? Because a lot of people can get that very wrong and it can end up being a very resentful process. Yeah, well, I think that um, the thing about Jim Knight's approach to coaching is he calls it a partnership approach. I mean, uh, it's not about being in classrooms and telling people what they should do. So uh, we have an expert teacher who will de- who will be the lead teacher in a lesson. The coach will then work with the classroom teacher whilst that teacher is delivering the lesson, uh, pointing out aspects of the teaching and the instruction, the resources being used, and having the conversation with the teacher whilst they're watching the, uh, the expert teacher demonstrate the lesson, so to speak, rather than just getting up there and saying this is how you should do it. Uh, that conversation is ongoing. The thing we do is we our staff use video, so they they will video a lesson and then self reflect on the on a, and try and develop a goal alongside with the coach about a particular part of their instruction that they like to work on and improve. So the the teacher themselves are very much empowered within this partnership approach. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Jason. I know our listeners are going to really benefit from your advice, your knowledge, and your resources that you've shared with us. If you'd like to access those, you can visit our webpage at www.inspirationforteachers.com. Before we say goodbye, Jason, if our listeners wish to contact you and connect, how can they reach you? Sure. Well, they could reach me at Twitter if they wanted to. And uh, that would be at Bordo74, which is B-O-R-T-O-7-4. So I'm obviously in Australia, but you know we can be connected across the world via social media, email, etc. I'm more than happy to um, share resources, uh, have conversations with people and just uh, you know learn with each other. That's something I really enjoy doing. Thank you for joining us today on Inspiration for Teachers. For more resources, tips and advice, visit our website, inspirationforteachers.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, we would love to connect with you. Just click like on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash inspirationforteachers. 